project, but um, I'm going to use this instead so I can kind of get more like low and very white in the middle of the world. Thank you so much for having me here. This is the funny part. from, they don't know where they came from, they don't, and moreover, they don't know, like, why you would pick one or pick another one. 
And so I actually thought it'd be funny just to talk about that with, and originally for people who live, really knew almost next to nothing, less than nothing about design. And uh, what I found was it was actually a fun way to, to look back at the stuff I had done over the past uh, 25, 30 years and get it organized in a way. So I've tinkered with it and made it a little bit more sophisticated for you guys. But basically, it's um, oh, my life has a fun. Okay? So um, this is Parma, Italy. I've never been to Parma, Italy. But that was where um, uh, Gian Battista Bodoni had his foundry. Um, uh, Bodoni uh, did the. Um, I base this name after him. I'm from Parma too. <laughs> but I'm from Parma, Ohio, <laughs> which is a suburb of Cleveland. Um, that's me in the back on Easter Sunday, 1969. My mom and dad, my two fraternal twin brothers, Ronald and Donald. <laughs> Sarasota at uh, Ringling, and um, uh, my mom was living in Fort Myers then, and she came to talk, and for the she says, I hate, she hates this hat, and secondly, she says, why does everyone laugh at your brother's name? <laughs> So, um, you know, you got, 
most of you all know, it must be coming darker, in a deeper, darker history all the time. Back in um, 2000, when we had the presidential election, a lady down in Palm Beach County uh, named Teresa LaFord, who wasn't a graphic designer, was nonetheless given a graphic designer's job, the most typical assignment in the world, um, fitting 11 pounds of shit in a 10 pound bag. <laughs> Her job was to fit all the names of all these candidates onto this butterfly ballot thing, the thing they jiggered together, and she just had to figure out how to get them all to fit. And so she figured, well, they went off it up. Usually, you do them on one side of those holes, right? Because they're on that end. You just line them up with the holes, and then people punch the holes, and that's who they vote for, right? In this case, there were too many to fit on one side, so she had to put some on the other side. So the trouble is that the, the, the type is bigger than the holes. And so she said, OK, I'll put the first one on the, on the left. I'll put the next one on the right. Then I'll put the third one back on the left. Then I'll put the fourth one back on the right which is a reasonable solution. However, some of those um, pretty good older folks in Palm Beach County came to vote, and they were they didn't want to vote perhaps for uh, President Bush, so they uh, decided they wanted to vote for Al Gore, next one down. So they punched out the top hole with the next hole down, and inadvertently voted for Pat Buchanan. Or so they started calling the Board of Elections, saying, I think I just voted for the wrong guy. And indeed, as you know, they came down to a massive recount um, that uh, uh, where the vote difference was in the uh, three figures, and sometimes at certain points in the two figures, before he's finally stopped by the Supreme Court, and uh, uh, George Bush was declared president. Had this battle been designed differently, um, you, we wouldn't have needed that recount, perhaps, and perhaps um, Al Gore would be president. Now, who knows what else would have happened as a result of that? Now, we'll never know, but just in case anyone ever says that graphic design doesn't matter at all, sometimes it's important. And the thing you work on tomorrow might be important, so watch out, okay? Uh, B, I, I warned you the first one was long. Was just, go ahead. Uh, this is um, New Scotland, right? Uh, by a good old Morris Fuller Benton. This is an old one too, 1908. Um, this is a like kind of graphic design that I like to do. Um, it's for the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which is the oldest continuously operating performing arts venue in the United States of America. It is older than <coughs> New Scotland. Um, and they put on very avant-garde performances. So one of the things we wanted to do was use this pretty straightforward typeface very consistently, but use it in a way that we always chopped it up. So we did different things with it. So sometimes you can use a very straightforward typeface and do an operation to it that makes, that makes it more interesting than it really is and makes it more distinctive than it really is. So I dare say in New York, um, anyone can use New Scotland, but only one place can run it off the edge of the page, and that's the Brooklyn Academy Music they do here, and they do in a lot of different places. Now, um, these, these guys are um, an impoverished nonprofit, and uh, again, there's the 11 pounds and the 10 pound vessel happening all the time. And one of the reasons I, I thought this would work was that if you chopped up the letters, you could just show one part of the letter, and it would make people think of the whole letter. So you could get real big type and scale, um, as you see here, you know, by only using like a fraction of the space that you had a lot. So, um, this ad, which is a really expensive uh, ad they run once a year in the New York Times, uh, only has one bit of unused space, which is this little square here. So once you commit to running type off the edge of things, kind of chopping it up and interrupting, you have to do things that are really com surprisingly complicated. Um, it's difficult to get paper cup manufacturers to print the type going off the bottom of the paper cup, not because they can't do it, because they're afraid you won't pay for it, because that's what <laughs> happening. <laughs> so you have to um, print a, you have to sign, I made a sign release saying, yes, we would pay for this cup if you print it this way. <laughs> um, we have a big signage program. A, uh, uh, we did the same motif with News Gothic in their, uh, uh, their old opera house, where we kind of played those modern letters, playing peekaboo around the Beaux-Arts detailing of the interiors. And then my favorite sign is this uh, men's room sign. You know, open the box, and there's three pieces in the box. Big piece here, this little piece here, and this real little piece here. <laughs> Don't throw away the little piece, it's important way. <laughs> C is for Chump Camp. This is a Florida project. Uh, Celebration Florida. I was the town graphic designer. Any of you guys been there? Yeah. Okay, so. Um, uh, we were approached by um, um, the town planners, Robert, Robert Amster and Alexander Cooper, 
and we're asked to be the consulting um, uh, graphic designers for the project. And our work would include designing all the street signs, designing all the manhole covers, designing all the uh, uh, highway signs and designing the signs uh, in the retail center of the town and on all the civic buildings, the bank, the post office, the movie theater, all this other stuff. And um, we wanted to provide a certain degree of consistency to everything and to make it look kind of, uh, you know, you know, it's a new urbanist town, right, built on um, uh, a model of um, uh, houses with porches that are set uh, fairly close to the streets, small yards, large common areas, um, walkable to a certain degree. Um, and so we wanted to do something that kind of, a nice robust typeface that would work in a lot of different media. And uh, yet, yeah, our fear was that we would have to present this typeface uh, not just to Robert Ann Stern and Alexander Cooper, the two main architects, but all the architects who've been hired by uh, the Disney Corporation to design these signature buildings. And that included Michael Graves, who designed the uh, um, post office, Bill Johnson, who designed the town hall, Cesar Kelly, who designed the movie theater, Robert Venturi, who designed the bank. All these guys are Christopher Prize winning architects, very intimidating and very opinionated about everything, including typefaces. So we picked Sheltonham just because I thought it was the best typeface. And right before we picked it, I looked it up in a book just to remind myself who designed it. And I saw, thank God, it was designed by this guy named Bertram Goodhue. Bertram Goodhue is not a graphic designer. Bertram Goodhue is an architect. He, he designed St. Bartholomew's Cathedral in New York and the Nebraska State Capitol in Lincoln, among many other things. So when I presented this stuff to these architects, I'd always say, and you notice the typeface is uh, Cheltenham, designed in 1896 by Bertram Goodhue. And these architects go, oh, Bertram Goodhue. <laughs> This is one of just a watercolor painting. <coughs> it is in real life. We designed this logo to have a little girl with a ponytail and a bike and a dog and a fence and a tree. This is bringing all the main uh, elements of uh, civic life, transportation, uh, the built-in park in the form of the picket fence, the national park in the form of uh, um, the uh, tree and a little dog, uh, highway signs, markers as you come into town. All kind of use this combination of shell and pictorial things. It's a fence in the uh, uh, main turnaround center. It's a bunch of lovely, beautifully designed little parks, uh, each one of which has its own name and its own custom design. Broad iron sign. There's a golf club designed by Bobby Jones Jr. and Sr. I'm not a golfer, that means something correct. <laughs>
Yeah, you'll see that um, in fact the last sign was installed. In fact, the last sign was installed in July of uh, 2001. No, the, the, technically, the, our client was the Alliance for Downtown New York, which is a public oh, private so business improvement district. But everything had to be approved by the city and everything else. But there's just something nice about Chel about uh, you know, Cheltenham has a lot of personality. Interstate just kind of looks like it's pure function, right? So it's very straightforward. Okay, this typeface has some personality, known by some as a micro gamma, also called Euro style or Euro Steely. Um, by uh, all the over age in 1952. Um, There's this uh, architect named Eero Serenet, and we've designed um, all, we designed this big book and all the graphics for a traveling exhibition that started in Finland, which is in New York right now, and it's going to be at Yale University, we we'll talked for many years shortly. And um, Serenet was a, um, a real post war American architect. He designed the TWA terminal up in New York, designed the uh, Gateway Arch in St. Louis. Um, and just a real kind of like, you know, the, you know, that pre Mad Men era optimism. He was really perfect for it. And uh, Nova Reza had, had the same kind of optimism about Euro style. He um, was convinced that this was the typeface of the future because of the shape of that O. He, I, saw, I saw his, in print magazine, there's an article that I saw dating from the uh, 50s where all of Nova Reza introduces the typeface of the future. And he showed like a television. And he showed an airplane window, and he shows his O, and he's like, any questions? <laughs> Each time they would put out a new product, 
They just would say Guitar Hero on tour, Guitar Hero Legends of Rock, Guitar Hero World Tour, Guitar Hero World 2, 5, special Dan Halen edition version. And it's just this cool logo in the middle of yawning underneath all this stuff. And they also had a secret when they called us, which is they were thinking about introducing a brand new thing, which is going to be this thing called DJ Hero that maybe you've, you've seen and stuff like, right? And so they were actually basically looking for, just like Amalgamated Widget would be looking, they were looking for straight ahead brand architecture, you know, logical brand architecture that they could lay over this crazy world of rock and roll oriented games. And so what we did is we said, and this is how it would look, you know, they have guitar hero stuff attached to it in these uh, silhouetted figures in the background. Um, so I kept thinking, you, what if you had a logo that was more straightforward, but you change the logo all the time, like my favorite band back in the 70s used to do, Chicago. See, the logo is always the same, but they would get this great guy named Dick Fasciano to do these different versions of it, cut it into wood, sew it into a flag, make it into a chocolate bar, the one in the upper right, and I've always wanted to do something like that, and it occurred to me that Guitar Hero might be a chance to do something sort of like that. So we did this little family, Guitar Hero in the middle, which is uh, a little bit um, revised and fixed up. Um, we sort of like took uh, some of the really kind of weird nightmare before Christmas idiosyncrasies out of it and made it a little bit more of a uh, geometrically resolved <laughs> focus so we can do these other transformations to it. Plus we needed to make a family so we can kind of snap on the DJ for the DJ product. Then they also wanted to kind of rebrand their multi-instrument <laughs> game as a band hero. Uh, not because they were just getting confused with rock band, uh, but because they had their own personal reason they had nothing to do with rock band. Um, if you believe that or not, but that's <laughs> um, And so uh, what we did, once we had that, we were able to like do stuff with it. So we did some stuff with it ourselves, but then we got we got some money from Guitar Hero to just test drive it. So Rick Valicetti up in Chicago did a whole bunch of versions, the flaming version, the uh, fresh out of the uh, furnace version, the flaming hot exploding with electrical explosion. <laughs> then DJ Hero got a whole bunch of kind of neon treatments or cleaned out great treatments or kind of excited. Then Band Hero got these Mercury Lady Gaga kind of <laughs> And so um, these launched, uh, they, they've been doing the execution themselves, not quite as over the top as I would have liked, but they were kind of nicely done, particularly the DJ Hero one, I think they solved some nice problems with it. Uh, they did all these kind of like club stickers around it that I think actually forms a really nice uh, background for it. And then that, that mark and its uh, associated typeface plugged into the uh, equipment. And then this typeface Hero, we did a lot of different versions. And then it shows up in your instructions and things like that. Right? So H is another rock and roll to uh, motorcycles. Um, Harley Davidson has been a client for a long time. Uh, we started using this font called Knockout uh, that Jonathan Kepler, the Tobias Bear Jones partner, designed in 2000, originally for the magazine Sports Illustrated. And uh, the first thing I worked on for them was this 100th anniversary book. Uh, written by Willie G. Davidson. He's the young man on the right, uh, grandson of one of the founding Davidsons. He's been director of styling there now for, uh, you know, 30, 40 years. And so this big, brawny industrial type, you'll notice that you sort of get on the left there the same sort of big industrial type on their buildings. We wanted to use the same treatment in the books. Um, big statements by Willie and others kind of rendered in Playbill style. And a great survey of historic motorcycles wonderful vintage photographs. Uh, my partner Adam Miller did this great traveling exhibit for Harley that had this vortex in the center of uh, um, the main tent of it that uh, had all the names of the engine types that Harley's had through the years, the flathead, the panhead, the shovelhead, the B-Rod, all rendered again in knockout. And then um, my partner Jim Bieber designed uh, a permanent museum for Harley and Miller recommend to you very, very highly, and even if you don't care anything at all about so it's a great, great museum, it's great architecture. Adam Miller did all the installations there, it's beautiful, and um, I did just the exterior signage, an easy, big part, uh, so those are 
probably the biggest letters I've ever caused to have installed anywhere. Hand cut out of bricks in a pattern format. So that goes from, uh, I guess, rock and roll to uh, motorcycles to drugs. Uh, I want to take you right over to an exhibition about the psychedelic era at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on the um, uh, 30th anniversary of the Summer of Love, 1967. They opened this in 1997. Uh, the type you think was Cooper Black by Alice Cooper uh, from 1926. So uh, not particularly psychedelic as he designed it, I'm sure, but it was used on a lot of psychedelic albums. It had sounds by the Beach Boys. It sort of feels psychedelic to me. So there's I Am Pay's museum in my hometown of Cleveland with the banner announcing the exhibition across the front in psychedelic colors. Uh, my partner Jim Beaver did the layout of the uh, of the exhibition like a flower for flower power. You get that right. And then I did a lot of um, uh, Victor Moscoso and Rick Griffin sort of uh, uh, design stuff that I sort of uh, either channeled or stole from in order to kind of create some graphics on the outside there. Here you start to see some of all that Cooper Black being deployed all over the place, including the, um, the buttons that labeled the exhibits were all, the, the labels we did were all little buttons. Uh, and then we had some murals where we had, say, the names of uh, uh, the top 100 psychedelic bands, like that. A great timeline of the five years, all in Cooper Black, all in those psychedelic colors culminating in uh, John Lennon's Rolls Royce at one end and Janis Joplin's uh, Mercedes at the other. And then in the very center, uh, Wizard of Oz style, was the top 100 uh, psychedelic songs. You know, all in Google Play. Um, Jay is for uh, my hometown football team, the New York Jets, um, who almost made it to the Super Bowl, but <coughs> ran out of steam right at the end of the second quarter. And Never had a chance after that. But they went a lot further than any of the stuff they looked at was. Um, we were asked to uh, uh, design um, a, a set of branding assets for them. We weren't allowed to change their logo. They had the original logo. They changed it once, but then uh, Bill Parcells changed it back uh, to the logo that Joe Namath won the Super Bowl in, in uh, 19, uh, Super Bowl III in 1969. And, uh, uh, they weren't going to change the logo again. So we had to do a whole bunch of brandings. I've been bending and branding things for them without changing their logo. And I, I, like, I prefer this sort of challenge, actually. To me, it's more interesting. To me, a blank piece of paper is too easy. Or maybe I think it's too hard in a way. I like having a lot of limitations where I can say, what the hell? I wouldn't be allowed to change the logo, you know? <laughs> this is the best I can do. At least who's going to blame me if I don't make it all the way. But in this case, I think it's really some cool stuff. Uh, it's the logo on the helmet you see up there. We did the branding book, which has this kind of quasi astro turf on the uh, uh, Their colors are green and white. Uh, so there is the logo itself. Uh, a kind of outline, Clarendon, and the line in the background. A, the letters J E T S over that. Beneath that, oh, it's in a football shape. And beneath that is still another little football. Um, so we, it, it was, they only had these two colors to use either white on green or green on white. So we did this little halo thing. I could make it kind of burst out of a green background so they could use it on different kinds of backgrounds you could separate out. Then we commissioned Jonathan Kepler to do a typeface based on those four letters, J-E-T-S, that could be a whole bunch of letters and numbers called Jets Bold. And that really became, and still is, the graphic language of the team, this giant, big linebacker crunching only one weight, no lowercase, no Roman, no light. It's just you know, like extra ball, extra tender, extra big ass, uh, all caps, that's hard to think. Um, so we, we, we thought maybe they could have like, some additional accent colors. It turns out that like, football fans like hate accent colors because they're associated, I think, with homosexuality. <laughs> Have easy names like yellow green, 
They didn't want anything to do with it. All these other colors remind you of other teams. So you add a little bit of like, gold to that. It's just like the Green Bay Packers. You know, they just like freak out. So, like, I, I worked, you know, we worked with big, more important logos like City Bank's logo. But no one really, you know, it's a big, fussing, complicated thing, but no one really cares in their heart, you know, what color the thing is or the logo. And they just, I mean, this stuff they really do care about, so watch out. Um, so you can see we got some extra colors in there, but like only tiny, tiny, tiny amounts. A little bit of uh, light green. See a little bit of orange over there on the side, just a little bit, just in case you need it. And um, so uh, the thing we do, which was fun though, was you know the, their their other New York team, the Crossing Rivals New York Giants, have a logo that's big and Y on it. And people like things. People who visit New York and New Yorkers who are proud of being New York like things with N Y on it. And the Jets logo it didn't have N Y, it had J E T S. So we actually said, well, what if we had a logo where we just take, just take the football shape and just put NY in that? And what was really interesting was that we made some prototype hats of this, and we didn't even market test them. We just would wear them around and would say, where did you get the Jets hat? It doesn't say Jets on it anywhere. People knew between the color and the shape and the font, I think, brackets, you know. Um, then, one of my designers, Brett Trailer, discovered that that football is actually the mouth of a really mean-looking, um, you know, guard. And so we created this thing called Game Face, and that's what you see there. And then um, there's this guy named Fireman Ed who comes to every game and he leads this chant that goes J E T S, Jets, 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 Gay, everybody. <laughs> so we kept saying, in our scope of work, it said treatment of the chant. And I, I have to admit, I'm a, I'm a New York Mets fan as a baseball team. I sort of like, I've never been to a Jets game. And I said, what, what is this chant? Did they explain it? So we did this type of work, treatment of the chant. So that gets treated a whole different bunch of possible ways, and there's a whole bunch of different possible applications. And um, up until this year, they've been playing in Giant Stadium, that every time they play, they just put up a bunch of green stuff to make it look more like a Jet Stadium. So here's a bunch of um, uh, temporary uh, banners and, and architectural treatments just to make it look momentarily greenish. Uh, and I have to admit, the thing that we did make a big fuss about, that, that halo effect around the logo, Sports photographers love framing players with that halo. I've seen so many pictures of this. And then you see Firemen's chant, J-E-T-S, in the background there. And on that flag, like that, game face. <laughs> the answer into it. It's tough. No so, getting serious for a moment. Uh, K is for Alfred K. Knopf, the publisher. This is the type of called Felix. God, supposedly from, there must be some type case like this from 1463 from which this is adopted uh, by Felice Feliciano. Uh, but we used it on the, my favorite, I don't design that many book covers, not as many as Chip Kidd or uh, Barbara, uh, Barbara Wilde or Carol Carson, but I design one every once in a while. And I've only really gotten one really fun one to do, and it's this book called God Biography. So I only had one idea, just to like take the three-letter name and make it too big to fit on the cover. So that's what we did in this lovely typeface Felix. Um, L is uh, for a uh, line we have called Weaver House, which is a, a vintage skyscraper in Midtown Manhattan. This is another one by Jonathan and Tobias. Um, Lever House was the first class skyscraper on Park Avenue north of Grand Central. 1952, same age as uh, Nova Reyes, actually, as uh, Eurostar. Um, very bad men in this character, I think. And usually, the thing that frustrated me was you have to use, if you use it on the box covers, you can use Futura, which is boring, and people don't even see it anymore. Um, they were using avant garde, you know, Jesus, you know, if you know what that was, like, it's a really bad idea, 70s type face, very bad. And uh, Noita, which, which is nice, which is a little too 30s for me. So we had Jonathan Tobias go to the site where, sort of in jet style, there's a bunch of letters on the wall already. We said, take those letters, figure out what the whole outfit would look like just from the letters that are there, which they did. Designed this beautiful typeface called Lieber Sands. Isn't that nice? Holy cow. And so then we reinstalled all the signs on this building when they did the restoration of it back in. Really beautiful uh, typeface. And then, of course, you, you, when you do new signs, or all these signs they didn't need back in 52, that are ABA required and all these other things. So we try to make it both modern and uh, uh, feel like it was typical. Restored all the original signs that were there. Too. I told you this would go pretty fast. We're almost halfway through. We'll just go fast, pretty fast. M is for uh, Museum of Art. 
Arts in Design. Uh, this is a typeface that we designed ourselves, a uh, designer named Joe Marianic did it. Uh, this is just a couple years ago. Uh, some of you may know this project. On Columbus Circle in Manhattan is this museum, newly opened, uh, just in the fall of 2008, uh, celebrating uh, craft design, meaning that it's, uh, it's everything in there is something that has a utilitarian purpose, but usually handmade. So it's everything from vessels to chairs to wall hangings to garments, let's say. Um, and from all over the world, from all kinds of areas, all sorts of artists, all sorts of materials. Um, in a building that has this idiosyncratic odd building uh, on Columbus Circle, Manhattan. Uh, and so we wanted to do a logo that kind of worked the same way the collection did. If you think about the collection, it's a bunch of different artists who take simple forms and do different, you know, it's like, how many ways can you do a vase? What can you make a vase out of? You can make it out of glass, you can make it out of ceramics, you can make it out of straw, right? And you could do it in all kinds of different ethnic traditions. You could do it, you know, tomorrow you could find one that was done 100 years ago, all sort of contributing to the same thing. And so we thought, um, what if we had a very simple form derived from the idea of the museum that people could treat? They have this great acronym, right? MAD, M-A-D. There's also a magazine called MAD. That logo is already taken to a certain degree. But we said, look at the footprint of this building. It's got three straight sides, one curved side. It's also an honest circle, the only complete traffic circle in New York, in Manhattan. And it's a squares building, it's just an grid. So we said, what if you took circles and squares and combine them into each other to get this logo back, right? Now, this is important. This is pretty much the presentation that I would do um, to the board of directors and things, right? And this was the way the building used to look before it was renovated. And you can sort of see it has those circles and squares and shapes like that already inherent in it. And so with it, we have this typeface Futura, very simple uh, geometric typeface by uh, Renner. And then the theory is that that uh, logo can change colors. It can contain different sorts of patterns. It can contain scribbles or figurative things or photographs or material, be made of materials. So we look a lot of different ways. We change all the time, right? So then we did this typeface based out of that, which is sort of fun, called the math base. And then we can write different things in that typeface, and they can get sort of this branding that cuts across all 26 letters of the alphabet. It's not only, I mean, when you, we, we use Futura for like the important signs that people actually have to read. Um, and then we don't do this that often, that thing you see the blue thing down there. Although it's fun, and I maintain you can read it, it's kind of interesting. But some of those bases don't look like bases. You know, so why should the star look at that was like an arm? That's what I would say. Uh, so when they, when they launched, uh, this was sort of a graphic language they had out on the streets. Pretty fun. Print material, invitations, um, publications, membership cards, packaging for their gift shop, a lot of fun stuff for that. Shopping bags, ties for the passionately <laughs> T-shirts that actually uh, say, if you can read this work mad, sort of like making you an insider and you decide for this unreadable fun. So and this is all pretty much all still up and running if you can get to New York. I would recommend this museum uh, very much to you too. My partner, Lisa Straussfeld, did a beautiful series of installations, a lot of digital installations that help you move around the different floors of it. You can see some of it there. And that's uh, an animated uh, Totem pole next to the elevator is quite nice too. So the next one is um, and I think uh, for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, this great typeface called LM LMVDR for Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. You know who that is? It's a, a famous Wait. German Bauhaus. Uh, he's the last master yes. Bauhaus to close, and he moved to uh, America. Uh, in Chicago and designed the building that's right across here from the Eager House, the Seagram building, and a bunch of other truly beautiful buildings. Tough guy. Uh, and Chester designed this typeface kind of an homage to him. And we used it for the logo for this place called the Glass House, not designed by Mies van der Rohe, but by one of his disciples, Philip Johnson, who was the associated architect on the Seagram building. And we built this, you know, who was fortunate enough to uh, um, have wealthy parents who set him up for life. He went to design school 
All the other architects built models of their thesis project. He actually built a house. And for the critique, he had all the professors come and see the house in real life. Like he had a party there. And he also had a, a, like, a, a, a like a house boy serving martinis during this whole thing. That's how to do a critique. <laughs> Full size with martinis. At any rate, the glass house, the notorious house that he built in um, New Canaan, Connecticut, uh, and then surrounded it with more and more structures as he lived there over a period of uh, 40 years. Uh, seen by very few people, only his friends while he was living in it, but he agreed to donate it to the National Trust upon his death, and the National Trust did take it over. Now they have to run it over to the public, so it didn't need a logo before. Your house doesn't need a logo now, neither did his, but now it needs one because it's out there as a public entity. So we did this very simple logo, just to emphasize the word glass. Uh, a very simple type of uh, uh, website with a, a little bit of transparency happening on it. And then the print publications all use this beautiful, modern, uh, but very straightforward font. Uh, for the uh, grand opening, we did this custom book in a square with a real piece of glass as sort of the effective title page. Uh, and then with my partner, Jim Beaver, we designed a visitor center in downtown, little downtown New Canaan. Uh, which is where you have to park and then you're taken in a car over this place. Like another thing I recommend to you, by the way. So it's got a lot of uh, glass logos kind of moving through it in a way. Quite nice. Oh, this is a, uh, um, i trying to see, this one is, uh, without any angles, this is I out of order, so I think this is O for Obama using Gotham. Everyone knows that uh, Obama uses Gotham, right? Uh, that was famous, right? So I did this poster as part of this bigger project with Honors for Obama. And I have no, like, I feel like, you know, Shepard Ferry had already done his notorious, uh, his legendary and famous and non notorious and possibly uh, criminally uh, uh, prosecutable poster, uh, the Hope poster. Um, and so I didn't want to try to do another portrait of the guy. So I was driving along in my car with my kids saying, I'll do something with just a type. And what if we just like renamed all of the states after Obama. And so you're, you guys are uh, uh, for, for Obama. That's not I like Alabama, though. I like that one. Or Ohio. Ohio. That's where I'm from. Ohio. Um, and so um, I said th th this was supposed to, you know, this was potentially going to be printed to promote the campaign. But of course, you know, it is silly, and that wasn't one of the brand attributes they were going for. And it's also like really kind of pretentious, like I will name. I will rename all the states after this. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I certainly didn't pick up on that part of it. But, um, beautiful typeface got them, actually. Overused, perhaps, but uh, the way that they ran that font, you know, if they could do to healthcare what they did with uh, uh, Gotham, uh, it all be covered. So, P, this is uh, Memphis by Rudy Wolf back in 1930 for uh, Princeton University in their athletics department. I didn't design this one. This was this, uh, the, this was designed by their um, by their merchandise people, and the president just hated it. They're, the Princeton mascot is a tiger, and so okay, there's the colors, right? Of sports teams, dangerous. Also, mascots, dangerous, right? And so my contact, we've been doing some more undangerous work for Princeton, little brochures and things, right? And so she said, we're having trouble redesigning the tiger. Would you help? And I said, I don't want anything to do with this. Because I know what happens when people do this. And she said, why? What's wrong? It's just a tiger. And I said, no. The trouble is that people, you, the designers were coming with tigers. And then everyone will sit around and say, that one looks sleepy. That one looks mean. That one looks too mean. That one doesn't look mean enough. That one looks more like a lion. That one looks cross-eyed. Now that one looks, you know, it's, I just don't, I'm not a cartoonist. I don't like do tigers. I don't want anything to do with this. And so they commissioned professionals who specialize in things like this to do this. And then the president of the university just hated this because she thought it looked like a disembodied or a, a decapitated dead tiger head mounted to a shield, right? <laughs> and she thought, well, she, and, and Princeton is a very low-key preppy school. I don't remember, it's like, I didn't go to Princeton. I went to the University of Cincinnati, a cheap state school. Um, but I know people went to Princeton, and it seems to be a really like preppy F. F Scott Fitzgerald kind of like classy place. And this doesn't. This looks more like a Big Ten, like my wife's school, Iowa State. It looks like an you know, Ohio State, you know. I won't name any local teams. Of 
course this conversation. But so we said, okay, we'll put tigers on it, but we're going to treat the tiger like the Lacoste alligator. Okay? <laughs> you guys are preppy. Let's see how preppy you are. <laughs> so the P is uh, based on you know old jersey that they had, and you can see it gets a little crude on the bottom. The tiger stripes, you know why not? Um, the color scheme is very simple, orange and black. And then we found four tigers on campus, each one a different statue based on a, a building that was done in the uh, 19th century. And we named each one of them uh, after the building it was on. And so those uh, tigers are the ones you get to pick from, right? Combined with um, a whole palette of the shield, the chevron, the colors, the P, the word Princeton. You can put, so that every team there, the lacrosse team, the crew team, the softball team, the wrestling team, each one of them kind of build their own uh, insignia out of the ingredients. And so the tiger is used a lot of different ways. And sometimes when you create, see this crazy pattern to put as a thing on flip flops, you can find things in the two. Do some things we made. And those hats are kind of cool looking, right? And this is exactly how Princeton people like it too. They just kind of, you know, like they don't know each other, but they run into each other like on the street, it's kind of like <laughs> So we brought in all these different people to help with this. An illustrator named Lynn Pauley did a 
a series of portraits. Dorothy did another set for another school that you see here. Oh, that's my wife. She did this set, and then we did this kind of Andy Warhol-ish sort of pop treatment of it just to mix it up a little bit. Because, you know, the kids don't see all the different libraries, but the librarians see all the different libraries. And so we wanted each librarian to think that they're, they weren't like running a Starbucks where it's about uniformity, they were running a special place that was just for them. Peter Arkel did a uh, one that's almost all in black and white where he interviewed the kids and sort of sketched them uh, and, inter and broke down their thoughts. So this thing it would take forever to decipher. It's got so much text and so much detail on it. Um, this is uh, the incredible Christoph Neiman. Um, did this whole series of drawings, uh, all incorporating books in Abraham Lincoln's beard or in Moby Dick's mouth with the, um, um, uh, the Dewey Decimal System designation for the different books associated with it. This is by um, uh, Automatic Art Design, Charles Wilkin. This is one by Raphael Square at El Capo. Uh, this is Stephen Sagmeister did this one with one of his quotes. Everybody who is interesting is not boring or something like that. And then Michael Coleman did this incredible one as well. It says installation of actual objects that she put together that just on a black background, just these weird objects that sort of have some relationship to each other, but she won't reveal it. And so people just, there's a stuff below the shelf that's the one level of knowledge and the stuff above the shelf that's the more cosmic knowledge. The best thing, okay, so um, we do this virtually for free, except the payment comes every time they open one, they have a party, a little ceremony where you're greeted as you come in, there are speeches and presentations, and everybody has a good time. And um, in a library like this, thank you. And, uh, this, okay, so this is where I, I, I sort of always thought, first I thought that the school board was the client, and that was sort of, we all make this mistake. You think the person at the table is the person we have to make happy, right? And then you realize there are other people that, oh, the kids are the client. Oh, I think the kids happy. But it took me a real long time to figure out Kids will come and go. The school board, they're just, they're, they make it all possible, but they're a few steps removed. The people this is really for is the librarians. This is their stage, this is their house, this is their store. They're kind of the people that have to be the proprietors to make, make a great experience every time a new kid walks in that door. So one of these librarians uh, said uh, about, we, we, we went around and visited them if they were all up, and uh, she said, um, it was at the end of the day, she said, I'm going to turn out the lights, I'm going to turn them out the way I always turn them out. So she turns out all the lights except for the lights that light up the kids, leaves that on last, and leaves it up to her mom next week. She said, leave this on, just remind me why we do all this, and then turns that on. Wow. <laughs> okay, that's very touching. Now we'll make some crass commercial money. <laughs> Maybe a logo like Target's logo that works so 
so well. If you imagine showing someone a logo that's a dot with a circle around it and say, here's what I came up with, they would say, what, that's it? <laughs> you know, they don't understand that the, the, the Harvard logo isn't, isn't that logo. It's all, you see that logo and you think of all those commercials, all the choreography, all the product, all the wit they bring to it. Tiffany Blue, that's nothing. That doesn't mean anything. You think about all the nice things that people have received at really beautiful moments of their lives in that. So they wanted the same thing. And I, I remember thinking, you know, I don't know how we're going to do it, but, I, but their CEO said to me, well, how do people know this is a Saks bag? And I said, I don't often make guarantees. But I would say within one month, everyone in New York will know that this is a Saks bag. And it, it, did, it took one week. It was like in the newspaper, it was like, you know, Saks is new bag, really made a nice splash. I have to admit. It was scary though, just so you know, we, um, uh, this, we did, this was the third presentation, and the first two were more or less disasters where I didn't have, and I, we didn't have an idea for it, and I just kind of like came in and said, here's what we're thinking. And we had a really patient, encouraging client who just kind of urged us along and finally we came up with this. So I think it works pretty well. When you use it really small, it kind of turns into like a herringbone pattern. And then you can put it on, you know, everything. So this is, a, I like to, I like it when the logo's already done. You know, I get nervous about any new logo. So the sax logo's sort of already done. We just fixed up Carnese's uh, calligraphy. This is the New York Times logo. Uh, typeface design, tuned up by Matthew Carter in 2005 called Fracture 6. And we were asked to do the signage for this brand new building the New York Times was doing. Uh, here's the trick with this building. It's in the Times Square district because the Times Square is named after the New York Times. Uh, every building in the Times Square district, to keep the character of Times Square, has to have signs on it. It has to have at least one giant sign attached to the outside of the building. Now if you're like a theater or if you're like, you know, one of those a commercial building, you like having signs uh, on your building. If you're a, a corporation like the New York Times, you're a little bit more reluctant to. Moreover, uh, they commissioned Ren uh, this uh, great uh, designer named Lorenzo Piano. Oh, no, Tibor Coleman did that with yeah, Tibor Coleman did that with uh, uh, good question. No, Tibor Coleman with Robert A. Stern, the co-designer of the uh, town plan for celebration of it. Um, so this building is transparent. It has all the, it's all the glass except to make it not get so hot in the summer and not get cold too fast in the winter. Uh, Renzo Piano and his team designed this whole series of horizontal ceramic rods that kind of provide a sun shade all the way up each side of it. You can sort of see it there, that's what those white things are. And so, we need to put a really big sign in the building. We want to block the view of anyone from the outside. So we said, what if we attach all these little pieces that are each shaped like a little beak, like a little bird, sticking out. And then if they all go together, they sort of make the letters, right? And if you look at them straight on, you can kind of look through it. But if you look at it from underneath, they all go together because the beaks all kind of all converge. And so um, from the inside, it looks like that. You can barely see it. I still I would like to sit there behind the big tea, actually. The outside looks like that. Um, the, um, uh, the people at the time kept uh, saying, you, will this really work? And I kept saying, I'm not sure if it'll really work. But, um, <laughs> But we did like a test, and one of the things I really wanted to do was I wanted it to be white on white, so it would feel like it was blind and lost on the side of the building. Wouldn't that be cool? Like, you can hardly see it. Like, is it there? Is it not there? <laughs> and I, I, got, I, I got really enthusiastic about it, and I, I described it in exactly those enthusiastic terms to the building owners and the client. And um, you can see this whole idea of, of really big signs that were not really visible. Uh, <laughs> kind of like didn't appeal to them. <laughs>
team rooms with prompt things. And what's a metaphor? You know, little tugboats guiding the ocean liner as a team. Hockey team. Dance with Bob Foster and some dancers. Serious. <laughs> Oh, and then the copy room. It's a room called privacy. But I'm going to just go in there and weep quietly. I'm going to go in there and weep quietly. These things will rise your closet. And that was a bell. <laughs>
Hey, we're almost done, right? Um, X, the museum of sex. Here's how better it the way for 1957 Max Meyer. Um, so it's fun designing a logo for the Museum of Sex. It's a real museum, a serious museum, with actual scholars putting on different historic and other exhibits there. Um, if you go there to be um, turned on, you, you, you might in a very professorial, academic way, uh, but in the down and dirty way, um, it's probably not the place for you. Um, <laughs> so we try to emphasize that it had X-rated content by emphasizing that last X, which sort of also gives the Word mark the cat of a character of a sperm model so I don't know why the little head and a trailing tail. The X becomes the kind of protagonist in the whole ticketing thing. Sign in the front, you pass through the X as you go in. Serious t shirt for lonely Opinion about you know type you know 
here's here you were invited to um, enter this competition in Helvetica or in <laughs> in Schneebler or in, in whatever in Obo and you know whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so um, finally, one of the one of the few really great ideas I've had in my career. My daughter Liz was four and a half years old. She had not yet learned to read, but she had learned the alphabet. So I said, Liz, would you help me with something? If I gave you a, um, you know, pen and paper, we just write down these letters in the order I tell you. And she said, okay, it's not like fun at first. Um, and so she wrote, I dictated letter by letter the statement to her. And it was perfect because I was somehow putting this message through someone who had no idea that there was anything called a typeface, no idea that there were differences in the typefaces, no idea that people would have fights about this or care about it or say, why did he use that typeface? All she was into was the idea that letters communicated things. That's the only thing she understood. And I read it to her, then I read her the word, and she sort of put up, um, you know, she, she had that excitement, that excitement to discover you have to discover something new, right? That we talked about earlier. And so this was the uh, poster, by my, the typeface by my daughter Liz, 1992. Um, here it is. And it says, what is good design? Is it problem solving, or is it the coolest thing you can make the client buy? Is it type reversed out of an oval? Little books found with twigs? Old clip art Xerox stuff 100%? Frankly, Gothic and a lot of different sizes all jammed together? What if one letter is a different color? Or maybe some emigrate type of a picture on a chair? Should we layer in a quote from Foucault? Or maybe Groucho Marx? Is this good design or is it something more? Well, <coughs> I still have all those questions, but the big question is is it something more? And it says something more that makes me go to work every day, hoping that I'll discover one more answer to that question, is it something more? In this one of these projects, I found some part of that answer, I think. But the thing that's interesting about design and exciting about design, and what makes design so worth doing as a designer, if you ask me, is that unlike people who have these other jobs, you know, like uh, Deborah mentioned accounting or something, someone mentioned accounting, I, I get to kind of come and start creative too, and that's and they go to jail, actually. Um, <laughs> you know, you get, every, every day when you go in, you have the, um, it doesn't happen every day. And like, sometimes I think it only happens to me like once every other year. But it, you never know when it's going to happen. That's casinos operating that. It's what's called intermittent reinforcement. You know, if you get money every time you pull the handle, you sort of get the hang of it. But it only happens every once in a while, you really keep doing it. So I think um, you know that intermittent reinforcement you get is on this one keeps coming back in. That quest for something more is always what the possibility is. Um, today's um, Thursday, right? So tomorrow's Friday. So we go back to work. So we go to class. I hope that each one of you discovers that design can be all this and something more. Thank you very much. I'll take questions if there are any.